and welcome to AFAX CMO Dialogues. I'm your host, Susmita, Executive Editor at AFAX, and I have with me today Anuj Sharma, CMO at Xiaomi India. Welcome, Anuj. Thanks, Susmita. Thanks for having us here. Very happy to have you because, Anuj, I was looking at, you know, your profile and I figured that in a career spanning about 20 years, you seem to have specialized in selling smartphones to Indian consumers from Lenovo, Motorola, Razer, a gaming phone and Poco and, you know, your second stint at Xiaomi now. So I wanted to start with, you know, in these, um, you know, 20 years, um, how have you seen the, uh, I mean, you you definitely have seen the smartphone landscape evolve, right? But have there been any fundamental developments that you didn't see coming, um, but have ended up, you know, reshaping the category as a whole? Actually, when I started, there were no smartphones. <laughs> uh, so just the fact that, you know, from basic communication devices, uh, you know, phones changed something uh, as a computing device itself was fundamentally different but uh, I think every three to four years we start looking at the next level of changes that are coming in so if I look at smartphones today right yeah. I mean they can do everything that a phone could do but they are also now your primary camera in fact in some of our devices for example they can go head to head versus like a professional camera uh, but it's a professional camera that you always will have with you. So uh, every year, from a technology perspective, there is a seismic change that keeps coming in. Except I think, you know, we've just gone through this massive growth curve where the percentage growth seems a little less. But uh, I think, you know, there is a lot happening even today. Uh, and even for the next two to three years, the overall lineup uh, from a tech perspective looks very exciting. And so you spoke about cameras and that has been the major, you know, selling point when you market a phone to consumers. And now we are seeing that a lot of brands um, are talking about the AI abilities that a phone has. Um, is that where the battle is next? Uh, AI, I think, is going to help a lot. In fact, uh, the work on AI actually had started a few years ago. I remember back in 2019 itself, you know, when we were talking about new chipsets coming in, there was a separate benchmark that started off on the AI side. Mm -hmm. So that work has been happening. Uh, LLMs or basically the whole chatbots in a way, uh, I think they've exploded onto the scene for the last two years. But the AI part, especially in imaging, has been there for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is fundamental to a smartphone camera today because, you know, while I said that it goes head to head against a professional camera, from pure physics that are involved in optics, uh, a smartphone camera, which is less than one centimeter, will never be able to compete with the professional lens. But that's where the AI kicks in and enhances certain images, is able to do color calibration a little better. And at least for you know all of us, uh, you know, normal folks, uh, barring the, the professional photographers, uh, this turns out to give you a better uh, result and actually a quicker capture. So I think it will go head in, uh, hand in hand. Uh, it will continue to kind of evolve, continue to improve, but beyond LLMs. Okay, got it. So you're saying it's more of, you know, of more fundamental integration into the features that a phone might have and not necessarily, you know, can... Um, a Xiaomi phone, write an email for me, or you know, just respond exactly. to a text or something. Yeah, I mean, those parts are nice, but okay. they don't fundamentally kind of change how you use a device, mm -hmm. right? So AI or machine learning, for that matter, in a device is supposed to be easing your overall workload, mm -hmm. making things a little better, and also learning from you in terms of what your uh, usage patterns are. Mm -hmm. So over the next few years. Uh, our expectation is that, you know, with your phone and your connected homes, all of it is learning from you. So I'll give you one example, right? Say uh, you are driving back home in your car and uh, it's a warm, humid day. You've turned the temperature down to 21 degrees centigrade. By the time you're getting close to your house, the AI is able to predict saying, okay, uh, normally it takes me about 
say 10 minutes to cover this distance, but today is going to take me seven minutes. So it'll have to switch on the AC at that particular time and get the room temperature to 21 degrees to match my car so that for me, you know, that transition is flawless. I don't even feel that things have changed and without even realizing, without having to work for it. And, you know, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the connected uh, devices. And often, you know, in India, when we think about Xiaomi, when we talk about the brand, it is largely from a smartphone point of view. Although, you know, the products that are there so um, could be bought by people, they might have them installed. But when you think Xiaomi, you think smartphones. Um, so what are you doing to maybe reinforce the fact that, hey, we also have all of these things and, you know, we could control, um, you know, help you control your homes better. Right. So a couple of things. I think uh, what we've done is over the past few years, I think uh, it's been a journey for the last five to six years where we have brought in different uh, elements of uh, home automation. So it started off with a very fundamental need, especially in the winter months in the northern part of the country where we got air purifiers. Yeah. Right? So uh, it was a problem that we were seeing and uh, we brought those in. They've been extremely successful. They're connected. You can get a read of what your room is. And currently through manual intervention, you can even kind of start it at home. So if, for example, you're going back from office to home and you see the PM 2.5 at say 100, 150 inside your house. So you turn on the air purifier and it starts kind of cleaning there. From there, during the lockdown, we realized that people were having problems cleaning their houses, uh, including, you know, me. Uh, so we had introduced uh, the robot vacuum cleaner. Right? So again, now I'm here uh, at around the same time every day, uh, my robot vacuum cleaner actually cleans and mops the house automatically. So when I go back home in the evening, it's already clean. Uh, there's no other intervention required. So we've identified certain key problems that people have been facing at home. Uh, security is another aspect for that matter and brought in devices. Uh, however, for India, you know, we are still lagging behind when it comes to home automation versus the world. So globally, Xiaomi is already the number one player when it comes to connected devices. Uh, we have more than 800 million connected devices globally. In India, it's much smaller. And, and the fact is, it's just pure... Uh, you know, demographics of it, where in India, 650 million people use smartphones. So that's a huge market. Mm. But for home automation, the primary aspect of home automation is you need Wi-Fi at home. Uh, but when I look at Wi-Fi, uh, the wired broadband coming into homes is just about 12% of all households. So, you know, till that gets to a significant enough number, uh, this part will also have to take time to kind of scale up. The good news is with 5G and with the uh, CPE, which is consumer premise equipment for 5G, chances of getting home broadband is going to be much, much higher. So at least for the next five to 10 years, the growth looks very encouraging. Okay, good to hear that. And um, now I want to, you know, uh, talk about uh, the upcoming festive season and what you have planned. So I, I did see that, you know, you have, I think, three, um, you know, smartphone launches uh, planned or three three uh, price bands at which there are phones, uh, something in the sub 10,000 range, something around the 25 to 30,000 range and 40,000. So I want to know, how are you looking at the Indian um, smartphone consumer today? What are the requirements that are there? And um, what is that sweet spot from a price point of view um, that seems to work best for Xiaomi? Okay. Uh, so I'll probably split this again. Uh, for a large part of the users, uh, and this is something that we uh, started off last year, is getting them access to 5G. Mm -hmm. So we've actively worked since August of 23 to build a 5G portfolio in and around 10 to 15,000 rupees. Right? So this essentially has accelerated the overall market's adoption of 5G devices. And that continues for Diwali as well. Right? So we are hoping that more and more people are able to move from 4G to 5G, experience the better speeds, experience better connectivity. So that will continue to be. Uh, the next aspect is, you know, what 
I guess about four or five years used to be at about fifteen thousand rupees. That segment has moved up to what twenty five thirty thousand rupees. Uh, and those people are looking for the best in everything, right? So they want a good camera, you want good durability, you want great screen, so everything that they want. Uh, so they're looking at all rounders, and for that we've got the Redmi Note series. I think there's there's nothing else that comes anyways close to a Redmi Note uh, when it's offering that particular value. And then the flagship series coming. So the premium devices, uh, normally we classify premium as anything above 40,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. So over the last two generations, uh, essentially again starting from last year, uh, we have actually tied up with the world's best camera maker, which is Leica. Right? So Leica Germany and Xiaomi have been working together to bring in the best cameras in that segment. And this is a quite uh, interesting insight where you know, for a premium consumer, the other things aren't really changing too much. I mean, you already have a great battery life or you have fast charging, you have a good display. Uh, most of the people actually end up upgrading their devices or buying a new phone uh, because they want to get a better camera. Mm. Uh, so that's essentially why we said, okay, you know, one, let's get Leica in. This is the best you can get. And uh, then we focused on our Xiaomi series there. So the Xiaomi flagship series obviously takes a name from the company itself. And uh, there's the Xiaomi 14 series, for example, are the, is the focus this year. Okay. And so I want to know, um, you know, you said that the premium segment, um, fairly so, um, they upgrade only for a better camera. And Xiaomi's, uh, I mean, I was looking at some of the data from IDC, CounterPoint, and the uh, data says that, you know, most of Xiaomi products, um, the ones that are, you know, the large volume comes from the mid-tier and the sub-10,000 uh, segment. So is this a uh, collaboration with Leica and, you know, talking about this particular product and its features, helping you... Um, I mean, get people to buy into the premium product more. Have you seen uh, a significant shift so far since August last year? So for the premium segment, again, it's it's a new journey. Uh, and we understand it's going to be at least like a five to seven year journey where we will slowly kind of make moves there. Uh, but our belief is that as long as we are leading in technology, uh, we can get the enthusiast market, we can get the early adopters, and that will slowly kind of trickle down to uh, the other premium users but having the best possible devices out there with the best possible camera on a smartphone i think is definitely getting us uh, good initial green shoots earlier you know the entry level was 15000 and that has increased so does that also mean that your tg has changed or is it just that the disposable income has gone up and people are able to afford um, a phone that costs a little more. What has, uh, you know, triggered this shift? Uh, I think one, the TG actually has moved up. Mm -hmm. uh, so someone who was probably more comfortable buying a, a 10,000 rupee phone 10 years ago mm -hmm. is easily able to move up to like a 30, 40,000 rupee phone today. Uh, so a bit of time value of money. Mm -hmm. Second, that demographic actually, you know, getting from school or college into earning potential, having their own money to kind of spend. And third aspect obviously is uh, all the bank enablers that come in. Mm. So today it's a lot more easier compared to 10 years ago. And if I want to get a phone at say a no cost EMI, I can easily do so, uh, which did not exist earlier. So it's just kind of lowered the barriers to purchase compared to earlier. Got it. Um, also, um, something I noticed while I was preparing for this interview, and I thought it's pertinent to ask, is um, I saw that um, you had an interview um, with uh, Ranveer Alhavadia. And typically, you know, when a smartphone brand is, you know, trying to promote its, or not any brand, it's trying to promote its products, you see influencers possibly talk about the product, but you don't really see the CMO himself do an interview with the influencer. So has influencer marketing and how brands use it in some sense uh, changed? Uh, and can you tell me a little about how this uh, all came uh, to be? 
I mean, uh, so we do talk to a lot of people. Uh, I mean, like I'm talking to you right now. So in a way, you are also an influencer with AFAX, uh, talking, reaching out to your audiences. So I think it's it's different audiences. Uh, uh, for that particular interview, obviously, it was a very different, uh, you know, thought process. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just, I think we were, we ended up discussing what the entire technology landscape was mm-hmm. for a good two hours. So it was a good fun conversation that made its way into uh, YouTube or Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, coming to the influencer part of it, uh, yes. I mean, in a way, uh, these are breaking down the larger message for their own target audiences. Mm-hmm. So influencers have always been important. Uh, but with the advent of you know YouTube and other uh, you know social channels, they've been given a platform. Earlier, that platform did not exist. So if I go back, say, 15 years or 20 years, the only way you would get this information is you know, through the, the tech editorials on in newspapers. Uh, there used to be, I think, 20 years ago, there used to be just one technology-focused show on TV. Mm. Uh, and you had to wait for, I think, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock on a Saturday to be able to watch that. Uh, so things have changed quite a lot, uh, which also gives brands an opportunity to talk the right language with the target audience of that particular uh, influencer or that influencing set. Uh, At the end of it, it's all about consumers. So, you know, who are the consumers and how can you reach them? And what is the best way of reaching them? So it's like any other, you know, media mix. Uh, You have to kind of plan that out saying, how are you reaching them? uh, With what message and at what stage? And is influencer marketing, um, you know, becoming a bigger and bigger part of your media mix, especially during, you know, something like a festive season or um, Republic Day, if you have a launch around, you know, some of those um, occasions when there are sales? I mean, actually, not just, I mean, occasions, obviously, you do have, uh, you know, certain uh, messages going out, but uh, they become even more important for us when we're launching in a new product. Mm. Especially if that product has anything new to offer, which the market has not seen. Mm. What we realized is, you know, instead of one Xiaomi Mm. talking about a particular feature, uh, you may not be able to explain it to different cohorts. While an influencer is able to take that understanding and then tailor make that message for their cohort, right? So their use cases could be different. Uh, Their benefits, their perceived benefits would be different. So that's where the effectiveness of the message goes up uh, when you've got a good distributed uh, influencer plan. Got it. And, um, you know, Xiaomi itself has connected TVs, but uh, I want to know your thoughts about connected TVs as a medium. Um, Again, is it something um, where you would invest um, to advertise only when there is something like an IPL, you know, a big marquee, you know, event happening? Or is it something that you would invest in throughout the year? Um, what is your experience? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, whatever you have conversations with peers, what is that telling you about CTVs? So CTVs come in whenever there is a need for a campaign, right? So earlier, it was very easy. You know, when we were doing a media plan, say 15 years ago or so, Mm-hmm. All you have to worry about is, okay, you know, this, these are the X number of channels that you had to run. Mm-hmm. Uh, you needed a print ad in a national uh, newspaper and probably if you had to follow it up with radio or something like that, right? Uh, after that, now the, the consumption is very, very fragmented. So connected TVs have become a lot more important uh, for almost all campaigns. So they cannot be a campaign you say, I will forego this part, especially if you're doing a large-scale campaign. Okay. Uh, but how you use connected TV and what aspects are you activating will vary. So, for okay. example, if uh, I'm doing a mass campaign, which I need to reach maximum number of people, mm-hmm. then, you know, places like YouTube become super important. Mm-hmm. But if I am going with a very targeted uh, audience base, and I have a, a specialized message or a specialized device, or let's say, for example, if I'm doing a robot vacuum cleaner, right? Uh, I'm only reaching out to people who have, say, you know, who can have home automation, and hence the top 10, top 12% of the households. There, your OTT plan becomes super important. Mm. 
and in fact you know this year uh, for the world cup cricket world cup as well as, as well as i think wimbledon we did kind of focus largely on uh, you know the connected tv side uh, so i don't think it's any more a matter of should we add it to the mix mm-hmm. it's more of how do you use it in the mix and uh, how much push do you have to give mm-hmm. for xiaomi a lot of our consumers are essentially cord cutters mm-hmm. uh, you know when we talk to uh, some of our fans during launches or during road shows when we are out in their uh, cities some of them have not seen linear tv for a couple of years mm. uh, you know so they they cut the cord they move completely into uh, the connected tv space and they're f- perfectly fine with that so how do you reach those guys i think is important got it and another uh, you know i can't can't say new anymore because i think it's been here for a while but people are impatient and even one day delivery is not good enough you have to have it yesterday <laughs> right so um and are people wanting to buy you know smart bulbs um i don't know vacuum cleaners purifiers smartphones uh in 10 minutes what is your experience with quick commerce been like yeah i think quick commerce is probably something that's come in very quickly literally <laughs> uh and and changed our uh, you know usage pattern uh, i think what they did very smartly was obviously change how we kind of now order uh, groceries mm. uh you know i don't know 5 minutes 7 minutes 10 minutes i think pretty soon they'll just somebody will throw the stuff into your balcony and then collect it yourself uh it becomes super important for your impulse products to be there mm. uh, so for example you know we are one of the leaders when it comes to power accessories so you know your power banks uh right. so we introduced our first power banks in 2014 and we we've, we've been super successful ever since uh now power bank especially when you're traveling could become a super important thing uh, where instead of going to multiple shops if you know what you want to buy and it comes directly to you i think it's going to be super important or simple things like headphones audio speakers uh now on the phone side Uh, from a quick commerce perspective it could work uh, it's early days because from identifying the need to actually going and purchasing a phone normally the cycle is about 21 to 24 days mm. so it's a it's a high value uh, purchase yes. so chances are if you've made up your mind then you don't really care too much about pulling the trigger and and buying it on quick commerce but from the exploratory phase through the entire consumer decision journey different elements will continue to be very important yeah. so you will have to be on ecom you will have to have a very strong you know brand website uh, and in some cases especially for a high value item you will still have to deliver a good touch and feel retail response yeah. so it, they might might not buy it from any of these yeah. but it will come in the journey right so people try and collect as much data as possible before pulling the plug the final sale you know mm-hmm. if if i for example uh, i want to gift uh, somebody a uh, Xiaomi 14 now for me i i know enough about the device and i want it today saying i'm going to meet this person for his his or her birthday then quick commerce comes really handy uh, saying i can get it for 10 in 10 minutes and then i'm good to go so we'll have to kind of start weaving this into our overall plan for some of the the impulse items we already doing so so you okay. can get Xiaomi devices there so and one more thing i i know people are now going back to flip phones and Xiaomi has uh, them too but are they coming to india um, how is the market uh, warming up to flip phones in india so flip and fold uh-huh. so both two factors yes. right so one yes. is uh, i think flips are interesting where a regular phone becomes smaller so mm. you can flip it anywhere fold is where a regular phone becomes double the size uh, mm. great for productivity mm. uh the i've used you know so Xiaomi we've got uh, both the uh, mm. form factors uh, i've used both of them extensively uh it's quite interesting but there are three aspects that are still holding us back mm. so one is uh, the overall form factor still does not match up to a regular slab phone mm. 
So when you have a flip, yes, you've made the phone smaller, but the thickness is double. Mm. Right? So it doesn't really help you if mm. you're putting it in your pockets. Uh, with a fold, essentially, it's carrying two phones in one. So it's it's heavy. It's, again, mm. thick as well. Uh, so till the weight and the, the width is mm. solved for or the thickness solved for, uh, that continues to be one problem. The second problem uh, is the fact that these screens kind of fold, mm. right? So when the screens fold, screen technology has to be of a particular material, which is kind of softer. Mm. Uh, so it can get scratches very easily. It can actually break down very easily uh, if you get dust in. Mm. Right? So a speck of sand, if it goes in when you're closing it in, chances are that it'll start damaging your screen. Uh, so from a durability perspective also, that's point number two, it needs to kind of uh, take care of. So these are aspects that are continuously in the work. And the third one is, I think most of the flips and folds are closer to a lakh or above. Right. A very small segment of the Indian market right now is there. Mm -hmm. So two things could happen. One, you know, you start seeing these flips and folds come into lower prices uh, and hence the mass adoption could kick in. Uh, or they stay there and the consumers keep moving up and reach to that point. But both of them I see is at least a couple of years away, okay. either direction. So affordability is the third point. So, you know, from form factor, durability and affordability, these are three things that are holding us back. At Xiaomi, if we are to do something, we like to do it in a big way, uh, reach as many people as possible and obviously uh, work on our economies of scale. So we are still kind of looking at, you know, how do we play this in the Indian market? I think that's very well put. Basically, if I have to buy a flip or a fold, I'll wait for Xiaomi to enter the market. And then I know now it makes sense. Yeah, I, I think we'll, we'll put your name in for an early uh, <laughs> So, you know, um, one last thing, you know, is I want to know, you've spoken about media and, and all of that. Um, but if you can tell me, um, you know, in short, um, how you split your budget across, I mean, media is so fragmented now, there are so many avenues to spend money. But largely, if you, you know, had to put them in three, four buckets, um, how do you allocate your media spends, especially during, you know, the festive season? In, okay, for the festive season. So festive season normally goes mass. Right? So I'll remove the demographics of it mm -hmm. uh, because for normal campaigns, we decide in terms of if it's a particular product campaign, where does it sit? Mm -hmm. But for festive, you have to reach as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, there, the basic understanding is, you know, now that Xiaomi is omni-channel, mm -hmm. how many of our consumers are going to be online? How many are going to be offline? Mm -hmm. And there's an interconnect between the two channels when it comes to product discovery. Mm -hmm. So online consumer might be buying it from Amazon, Flipkart, or me.com, mm -hmm. but they might have at some point gone to a Xiaomi store and seen the product for themselves and vice versa, right? You might have a consumer buying it in a store, but has already checked out all the reviews, has already seen the product on Amazon or me.com or Flipkart and then come there. So we try and reach all of these guys. Uh, currently, in a nutshell, let's say about half and half. So half of our consumers are in retail, half the consumers are online. Uh, so from an ATL and digital perspective also, we will kind of split it around the same. Okay. And from an ATL perspective, uh, obviously outdoor. Uh, so this year we've done a couple of long-term outdoor uh, uh, placements. Uh, during Diwali, cinema becomes important. Mm. So, you know, you have some good releases coming out. So you want to be there as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got, you know, your standard primetime television and uh, some amount of print coming in, especially to declare those offers. So print, I think, works really well on that high impact, uh, you know, quick uh, dissemination. But then on the other side, the remaining 50% uh, would probably be mostly in terms of branding. Mm. So branding in digital space, uh, how do you kind of get the larger message out? Mm. Uh, and then a small part of it, probably about 30% or so would be on the performance uh, digital marketing. Okay. So, so idea is that, you know, you keep improving the, or increasing the top of the funnel mm. uh, and the bottom of the funnel, you have to just push certain fence sitters across 
Uh, but that doesn't need too much work if you've done the the hard work already. Got it. And so, so the rest of the year, do you do more of the hard work or do you do you know pushing some levers here and there um, when it's not festive? Uh, it's a bit of both. Okay. Uh, so sometimes for some some devices, you will have to kind of enable a push strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, in most cases, especially when we are launching a new device, it's mm -hmm. it's all about you know creating that interest mm -hmm. uh, and get as many people involved in your particular campaign as possible. Got it. I think that answers all the questions I had in mind for you. So right. thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Susmita.